Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I'm Jennifer Hevelone Harper, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 29th Annual Franz Lecture. Uh, this lectureship honors David Franz. Now, medieval scholars have a saying that we are all standing on the shoulders of giants. David Franz is one such giant. David taught history at Gordon for about half a century. He was part of the faculty that made the transition to the Wenham campus from Boston. He believed that understanding the world today is made uh, easier for students by seeing the world, seeing places where historical events transpired. He took more than 30 groups of students to Europe on Gordon's signature program, European Seminar, which I think we're celebrating the 70th anniversary of shortly. Um, starting, I hear that they dressed in suits and ties to board ships. Later, jeans and sneakers were the norm. Um, to make this affordable for all students, uh, students and their faculty uh, leaders slept in pup tents and infam infamously ate peanut butter sandwiches every day for eight weeks in the summer. I know this because I traveled with David Franz, who was my advisor, to Italy and Greece on his 30th, 30th trip taking students to um, Europe. Uh, even as Professor Emeritus, David continued to lead alumni trips. Uh, he was convinced that a liberal arts education was essential for building clear thinking human beings. Um, but the Franz Lectureship is not just for historians. David Franz was a visionary who helped shape the social sciences at Gordon College. He helped to found departments of political science, psychology, sociology, and economics. Which brings us to this current lectureship, in which the social science division each year invites a scholar to address a pressing subject of benefit for our whole student body in honor of Professor David Franz. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you today, students, faculty, staff, and members of the Franz family who are here today. Um, and I'm now going to invite uh, political science professor Ruth Melconian Hoover to come and introduce our speaker today. So, hello, welcome, so glad you're here. Um, today, I have the honor of welcoming Dr. Heather Curtis to Gordon today as our Franz lecturer. Heather Curtis is the Warren S. Woodbridge Professor in Comparative Religions at the School of Arts and Sciences at Tufts University, as well as Professor of History and Professor of Studies in Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora, and she directs the Center for Humanities at Tufts. <laughs> go humanities, go humanities. She received her doctorate in the history of Christianity and American religion from Harvard University, her MA in theology from Gordon-Conwell Seminary, and her BA in social and political thought from the University of Virginia. She is the author of the award-winning book, Faith in the Great Physician, Suffering and Divine Healing in American Culture, 1860 to 1900. She recently published Holy Humanitarians, American Evangelicals and Global Aid, Harvard University Press, 2018. And that, today's lecture draws upon this. In this lecture, she is uh, gratefully going to connect the history of evangelical philanthropy with today's heated debates over the politics of poverty relief and international aid. She has also yeah. recently written about the global expansion of American evangelicalism, Pentecostalism, child sponsorship programs, World Vision, Ida B. Wells, and black spiritual protest, among <coughs> other topics. We are delighted to have her with us today. Welcome and thank you. It's a great honor to deliver the annual Franz Lecture, and I want to thank the Division of Social Sciences for the invitation, especially Kristen Cooper, Ruth McConian Hoover, Bonnie Ross, and everyone who have helped to plan my visit, um, especially those who are providing amazing food and technology support and all the things, people whose names I don't know, but I know really worked hard to make this event happen, so I'm grateful. This opportunity is especially meaningful because speaking here at Gordon College about my work on evangelicals and humanitarianism brings me back to my days as a student just down the road at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary where I began the training 
um, in American religious history that brought me to do this work. When I entered seminary, I came with many questions about the relationship between Christianity and American humanitarian aid. As a child, I had learned in church about Jesus' teachings to sell your possessions to give to the poor and to store up treasures in heaven rather than, rather than accumulating wealth for yourself on earth. And I had heard the warnings from the letter of Timothy to the early Christians, quote, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have pierced themselves with many pains. I especially remember as a young person participating in a crop walk, it's where you walked through the fields of rural New Jersey, uh, to raise money for local food programs and international anti-hunger efforts. These experiences led me to ask questions, such as, why are so many people around the world and in our own neighborhoods suffering from poverty and hunger? Why do so many lack access to clean drinking water, to affordable housing and health care, to a good education? Why are so many of us indifferent to the suffering of our neighbors? And what should Christians do about it? These questions stuck with me over the years and eventually led me to pursue graduate study in religion at Gordon-Conwell. And so it seems especially providential to me to have been asked here today to reflect upon the concerns I have been wrestling with for most of my life. And perhaps these are issues that concern many of us in this room here today as well. Just last month, a devastating earthquake um, in Turkey and Syria caused the deaths of more than 52,000 people and left millions more in need of food, clean water, shelter, and medical care. As these disastrous earthquakes rocked the Middle East, atmospheric rivers created a series of monster storms in California that are still going on, resulting in catastrophic flooding and mudslides knocking out power to millions and stranding residents in snowbound mountain towns. The worst of California's storms are being visited upon the state's poorest residents, the unhoused, and the workers and families who often live in affordable housing units or lower cost rentals placed in some of the highest risk areas for flooding. Closer to home here in Massachusetts, the poverty rate is 12%, and 36% 30 per, of students in the public schools qualify for free or reduced lunch. Many of these children may lose this benefit if Republican proposals to cut the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, are enacted. So how should we respond to these crises as individuals, as local citizens, as a nation, as a global community, who is responsible for helping those in need, in immediate need? Is it government organizations? Is it humanitarian agencies, family philanthropies or private charities, religious congregations, all of the above? And how do we determine which of these crises take priorities? The earthquake in Turkey or the threat of famine in Ethiopia, Yemen, South Sudan, Somalia, and Afghanistan? the urgent crisis in California, or the ongoing crisis of child hunger in Massachusetts and across the United States? And are there ways to address the structural factors that have contributed to the scale of these disasters? Climate change, global resource inequality, racism. How should we balance emergency response with broader reform efforts? Why should the poverty, hunger, and suffering of our neighbors and distant strangers matter to those of us who are rich, comfortable, and secure? Of course, I do not have the answers to all or even any of these questions, but what I'd like to offer for the rest of our time together is some perspective on how a previous generation of American Christians grappled with similar dilemmas. As a historian of religion, I have explored how Christians in the past have endeavored to relieve suffering caused by natural disasters, economic crises, political violence, and other kinds of catastrophe, with the hope that the stories I uncover can put contemporary debates about poverty and hunger, welfare and immigration policy, philanthropy and humanitarian intervention into a broader context and provide some insights for our own efforts to alleviate the affliction of our neighbors here in Massachusetts, 
in our nation and around the world. The story I'd like to share with you today comes from my most recent book, Holy Humanitarians, American Evangelicals and Global Aid. And I'd like to begin by reading a few pages of the introduction. On a steamy summer day in July of 1866, 14-year-old Louis Klopsch stood in the middle of the Beaver Street cigar shop in Lower Manhattan, his body covered in blood and drenched with sweat. Just after he had opened the store for business, an excited Klopsch told his employer, four men had tried to steal a large quantity of cigars. Not the kind of chap to let such a proceeding go on without a protest, the boy attacked the would-be robbers with a piece of broken glass and a desperate fight ensued. Eventually, he succeeded in driving the thieves out. Although the store was a mess, Klopsch was unharmed, and his grateful employer offered him the handsome sum of $25 as a reward for his heroism. But several days later, the burglars were back, this time in greater force. Undaunted, the courageous Klopsch grabbed a crowbar and beat the six intruders until he had broken the skulls of two men and chased them all off. Now the shopkeeper became alarmed. Perhaps these criminals intended personal violence against him. He called the police. When the investigators searched the premises, they discovered a suspicious sack containing traces of blood hidden in the water closet. Putting this piece of evidence together with their doubts about Klopsch's story, the police questioned the boy again. Realizing that he had been caught, the young man confessed to having gone to a butcher shop, filled a bladder with blood, and returning to the store, scattered it about the floors and walls. The tales of the attempted robberies were entirely false. Klopsch was arrested on a charge of malicious mischief and after a brief incarceration was released into the care of his physician father, who blamed his son's exploits on drinking too much strong coffee and reading newspapers that filled his minds with imaginings. He, quote, thinks to be something large, the elder Klopsch lamented about his son, like the characters he encountered in the liar books that an irresponsible aunt had given him to read. Despite this prodigal adolescence, which included several more run-ins with the law, culminating in a two-year term in Sing Sing State Prison for forgery and insurance fraud, Louis Klopsch did become something large. By the time of his death in 1910, Klopsch was hailed as, quote, one of the historic figures in the annals of civilization, a friend of all humanity whose genius in the organization of benevolences made him a blessing to mankind. As a pioneer in pictorial humanitarianism and proprietor of the New York-based weekly newspaper, The Christian Herald, from 1890 onward, Klopsch took advantage of new printing and photographic technologies to publicize humanitarian crises at home and abroad. By deftly combining vivid images and graphic narratives of suffering with appeals to biblical injunctions about charitable giving, and to deep-seated millennial expectations about the United States' role as a redeemer nation, an important point that I will come back to later, Klopsch induced readers to, quote, open their hearts, hands, purses, and granaries to feed the hungry, to send or carry aid to the sick, and to spread the gospel message everywhere. With Klopsch at the helm, the Christian Herald became the most widely read religious newspaper in the world, raising millions of dollars for the suffering and needy of every land through a relentless succession of relief campaigns. For his work as an almoner of nations in distress, Klopsch was awarded the Kaiser E. Hind Medal of the First Class by King Edward of England in 1904, and was decorated in 1907 by Emperor Meiji of Japan with the Order of the Rising Sun. His biographer called Klopsch's life story a, quote, romance of a modern night of mercy and predicted it would inspire future generations of Good Samaritans. And indeed, it has. A century after Klopsch's admirers prophesied that, quote, he started some streams of work that will flow on and on forever, I stood in the middle of the Bowery Mission on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, my body covered with city grime and drenched in sweat. It was a steamy summer day in July of 2011, and I was helping serve dinner to 200 or so homeless New Yorkers 
participating in the mission's residential recovery programs. With my hair tucked in a net and my plastic-covered hands struggling to hold the slippery utensils sliding between my perspiring fingers, I clumsily dished up helpings of mashed potatoes, baked chicken, and greens beans for the hungry women and men who came through the line. After all had been served, I followed the crowd from the dining hall into the chapel, where the nightly worship service was about to begin. Settling myself into a pew toward the back of the building while the praise band started to play, I looked up. Prominently placed above the pulpit hung a commemor com plaque commemorating Louis Klapsch's role as president and patron of the Bow Bowery Mission from 1895 until his death in 1910. It reads, in loving tribute to Louis Klapsch, a true servant of God and humanity, his works do follow him. From the time of Klopp's passing to the present, the Bowery Mission's ministry to homeless and hungry New Yorkers has provided men, women, and children with free meals three times a day, as well as shelter, clothing, job training, and medical care. Klopp's legacy lives on in this faith-based organization, which strives to see, quote, lives transformed through the power of Jesus Christ. Although mission staff consistently refer to Jesus and his teachings as part of their work, they offer services to anyone in need, regardless of recipients' beliefs, and they accept volunteer help and donations from people of, quote, all different faiths or no faith at all. Through their expansive outreach programs, the Bowery Mission's leaders have made their enterprise one of the most well-known charitable ventures in and beyond New York City, and have built a broad base of financial support from individual donors, philanthropic foundations, corporate sponsors, and several government agencies. Although the Bowery Mission has become a prominent fixture on the nonprofit landscape, the origins of this renowned organization and its connections to a much larger history of humanitarianism remain relatively unknown. Despite his outstanding contributions in the fields of domestic charity and foreign aid, Louis Klopsch has been mostly overlooked by scholars and subsequent generations of philanthropists. So my book tries to tell his remarkable stories. In the chapters that follow the introduction that I just read, I trace Klopsch's transformation from duplicitous convict to captain of philanthropy and proprietor of the world's premier religious newspaper, showing how this entrepreneurial publisher and his enterprising partner, the well-known preacher Thomas DeWitt Talmadge, fostered a tremendously popular movement of faith-based aid that rivaled and indeed often outpaced the achievements of competing agencies like the American Red Cross. So today, all of you have heard the American Red Cross and probably none of you have heard of the Christian Herald. So I began by exploring how and why Klopsch and Talbage strove to make the Christian Herald, quote, a medium of American bounty to the needy around the globe. From a 21st century perspective, it may seem strange and surprising that a newspaper could attain such extraordinary success as a humanitarian relief agency. But as scholars such as Benedict Anderson and others have shown, during the late 19th century, newspapers and periodicals served as crucial vehicles for, quote, growing numbers of people to think about themselves and to relate themselves to others in profoundly new ways. Anderson's concept of an imagined community offers a starting point for exploring how Klopsch and his colleagues sought to harness the power of the printing press to achieve their ambitions. And we might think of as an analogy social media, right? This was sort of the social media of the day. So if we think about, we can talk about that later, perhaps, the way all of your generation and mine, too, are using social media to promote humanitarian aid as well. So shortly after acquiring the Christian Herald in 1890, Klopsch and Talmadge explained that they, quote, had two leading purposes in view. First, they aspired to make the Christian Herald the best known religious paper in the world by creating a cohesive community of readers bound together by what they called broad evangelical sentiment. Second, they planned to accomplish, quote, many good works through the agency of the Christian Herald with the hope that their publication would become an instrument for the betterment of humanity. Within several years, the partners made impressive progress toward these interrelated goals. 
During the first decade of Klopsch's leadership, the Christian Herald circulation increased exponentially from 30,000 subscribers in 1890 to almost a quarter million by the turn of the 20th century, nearly double the amount of its closest competitor among religious periodicals, and on par with or well in excess of comparable general audience weekly publications like Leslie's Illustrated or Harper's. The Christian Herald's readers came from all across the United States as well as from other nations and include, included members of large historic churches such as Methodists, Congregationalists, Baptists, Presbyterians, and Episcopalians, as well as participants in non-denominational organizations like the American Sunday School Union, the Salvation Army, and the YMCA. The newspaper's international scope and expansive reach among a wide variety of American Protestants made the publication unique among religious periodicals during the late 19th century and well into the 20th when its circulation reached a peak of nearly half a million subscribers. Klopsch later wrote that, quote, the establishment of the Christian Herald marked the beginning of a new epoch in the history of religious journalism in America. It was something new to have a journal so broadly evangelical as to commend itself to Christians of all denominations, which knew no sect or creed antagonisms, but treated all alike on the generous plane of Christian brotherhood. And it's important to pause here to explain what Klopsch meant by the adjective evangelical, uh, because as we all know, this term has taken on very different connotations in contemporary American culture and politics. Um, and I imagine many of you in this audience know this already, but just in case, just to get us all on the same page, throughout most of the 19th century, evangelicalism had referred to a loose transatlantic coalition of Protestants who prioritized conversion, warm-hearted piety, revivalism, and the reform of society. Within the United States, participants in this powerful tradition claimed responsibility for ensuring the success and stability of American political institutions, economic order, social relations, and spiritual health. By the 1890s, however, new trends in theology, biblical interpretation, evolutionary science, sociology, and psychology were creating fissures in this broad-based coalition. Many evangelicals feared that increasing dissension would undermine their cultural authority and the United States' identity as a Christian nation. Concerns about rising immigration, deteriorating race relations, escalating labor mm -hmm. unrest, the expansion of imperialism and other unsettling issues exacerbated these worries. Within this context, Klopsch and Talmadge proclaimed that their newspaper would refuse to publish articles on controversial doctrinal subjects or divisive political topics. Instead, the Christian Herald would embrace, quote, the widest Catholicity and seek to promote spiritual cohesion among its constituents. One of the most powerful strategies for fostering harmony among an increasingly fractious evangelical community, they argued, was to engage people of diverse theological perspectives and social backgrounds in a common enterprise of serving others. Participating in cooperative efforts to aid the afflicted, they believed, would enable individuals to set aside doctrinal differences, denominational preferences, regional disputes, social prejudices, class antagonisms, and cultural disagreements. Rather than arguing about whether Moses wrote the Pentateuch, as one contributor to the newspaper put it, Christians should unite to, quote, carry food to the hungry and fuel to the cold. The church should concentrate on fulfilling the clear commands of Jesus to clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, care for the sick, and visit prisoners. True religion, in this view, was not about policing theological orthodoxy, but in the words of the Apostle James, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. Serving as a good Samaritan to those in need was an especially urgent obligation for American Christians, Klopsch and Talmadge insisted, because suffering seemed more widespread than ever. During the late 19th century, innovations in communication and travel technologies were bringing the world closer together than in any previous time in history. And again, our access to social media and the internet makes this really relevant for us as well. News of an earthquake in Italy or a flood in China could make headlines in the United States within a day. 
refugees fleeing political violence, economic crisis, and religious persecution were making their way to American shores in record numbers. Millionaires were accumulating vast fortunes while the wages of workers stagnated and wealth inequality skyrocketed. Again, does this sound somewhat familiar? So how should Christians respond to these challenges? This was a question that Klopsch and Talmadge strove to answer through their newspaper. From the very first issue, the partners barraged readers with reports of humanitarian disasters around the globe as well as on American soil. Soon, they moved beyond merely chronicling catastrophes to actively spearheading relief efforts by collecting contributions and taking a direct role in distributing aid. In the spring of 1892, the Christian Herald publicized its first official campaign to alleviate affliction, a food fund for famished peasants in Russia. Over the next several years, Talmadge and Klopsch organized many more efforts to ease suffering of all sorts. During the winter of 1894, they encouraged readers to help families in New York City made destitute in a recent economic downturn. That spring, they raised money to relieve Midwestern farmers whose harvest had failed from severe drought. The following year, they solicited assistance for Armenians displaced by political violence in the Ottoman Empire. And next, they partnered with the federal government to rescue Cubans from starvation. From 1897 through the turn of the century and beyond, they engaged in massive fundraising efforts to provide for victims of famine, earthquake, warfare, and flood in India, China, Scandinavia, Macedonia, Japan, Italy, Puerto Rico, and Mexico. At the same time, they offered ongoing support for ministries to the poor and downtrodden throughout the United States through soup kitchens like the Bowery Mission, fresh air summer programs for children, and schools such as the Maysville Educational Institute in South Carolina, founded by Emma J. Wilson, whose mother had been enslaved on a nearby plantation. Even as they engaged readers in disaster relief campaigns and encouraged the funding of domestic charities, Klopsch and Talmadge insisted that responding to emergencies and alleviating the symptoms of social crises through bread lines and summer camps was not enough. Christians were called to embrace a more expansive vision for reforming global society that would reflect the principles of Christ's kingdom, the promises of justice, righteousness, and peace. Throughout his ministry, Talmadge consistently proclaimed that God was working through the processes of globalization to usher in a new era of unity, equality, and prosperity among the world's diverse tribes and nations. He believed that the United States had a special role to play as the place where God would bring together through immigration people of, quote, every race, nationality, and religion under the sun to live in harmony. Given these convictions, Talmadge was deeply troubled by the rising antipathy toward foreigners that was spreading among American citizens in the latter decade of the 19th century. Growing hostility towards newcomers from Asia and elsewhere, he worried, threatened the United States status as, quote, a refuge for the oppressed and the downtrodden of every clime, where all are welcome and all may abide in peace and safety. From their earliest days at the helm of the Christian Herald, Talmadge and Klopsch committed themselves to counteracting escalating anti-immigrant sentiment by publishing articles and editorials condemning restrictive laws, such as the Chinese Exclusion Act, and emphasizing the benefits of embracing diverse people who can contribute to the nation's providential destiny. God hath made of one blood all nations of men, Talmadge preached in a sermon on the New Testament book of Acts. Therefore, to quote, build up a wall against immigrants, he proclaimed, was to obstruct God's plan for making America, quote, the greatest nation of the ages. Instead, Christians should support charitable endeavors and programs designed to help refugees fleeing violence, persecution, and economic hardship in their home countries to find jobs, adequate housing, proper health care, and educational opportunities for their children. Through their work at the Bowery Mission, Klopsch and Talmadge saw firsthand the difficulties immigrants and other hungry, unemployed, and unhoused people faced in an increasingly volatile economic environment. 
as they became aware of the structural inequalities that characterized American society, these evangelicals used their platform at the Christian Herald to advocate for a variety of legislative measures, such as fair labor laws, child protection statutes, fair housing policies, and an expansion of public works projects designed to mitigate the adverse effects of laissez-faire capitalism among the country's most vulnerable populations. In response to many of their contemporaries who blamed the needy for their plight and criticized charitable handouts, these evangelicals insisted that, quote, what pauperizes the people is not the helping hand they occasionally get at a pinch from their sympathetic brothers and sisters, but low sweatshop wages, exorbitant rents, high prices for food. For how much of this the poor themselves are responsible, any fair-minded person can judge. End quote. Ultimately, what was required, they argued, was, quote, some radical change to address the real root of the problem. We all see that there needs to be a redistribution of property, Talmadge preached. To make this case, the Christian Herald actively promoted the platform of Christian socialism put forward by the Reverend Charles Sheldon, a minister famous for coining the slogan, do you know? What would Jesus do? Charles Sheldon, the author of What Would Jesus Do, was also the architect of Christian socialism. So contemporary evangelicals who wear WWGD paraphernalia might be surprised to learn that Sheldon advocated for a social revolution that would substitute cooperation for competition and commercial enterprise and institute, quote, this is from Sheldon, common ownership of common needs, such as transportation facilities, heating and electric utilities, water and food sources, and healthcare. Christian socialism, Sheldon insisted, was a clear expression of economic theories plainly stated in the Bible, and therefore ought to be espoused by all those who desired to usher in the kingdom of God. Now recall that Klopsch and Talmadge pledged to publish nothing controversial in their newspaper. Their critiques of anti-immigrant sentiment and laissez-faire capitalism did not create an outcry among their evangelical readers. Indeed, although the partners fell short of instigating a revolutionary transfor transformation of the social order, they did succeed in motivating their constituents to advocate for significant reforms. The Christian Herald's investigative reporting on child labor, for example, was instrumental in garnering support for the passage of new legislation in New York State in 1903. Through their coverage of international disasters and domestic crises, the editors inspired American Protestants from diverse backgrounds to extend compassion across national borders, racial and ethnic barriers, and religious boundaries. By the time Klopsch died in 1910, the Christian Herald subscribers had donated over $3.3 million to humanitarian crises. That's an amount equivalent to approximately $83 million today. Only the American Red Cross, which became a quasi-governmental agency in 1900 and was therefore subsidized by congressional appropriations, kept pace with the Christian Herald's accomplishments as an aid agency during this period. No other grassroots charitable organization, religious or secular, came remotely close. Through their energetic outreach and inventive methods, these evangelicals created a novel and extremely influential channel for the exercise of faith-based benevolence within and well beyond the United States. So why has Klopsch's story been forgotten, and what might we learn from remembering it? Subsequent generations have lost sight of the Christian Herald, in part because records of the newspaper's efforts to engage its readers in charitable enterprises have not survived. Other than copies of the publication itself, some laudatory biographies of Klopsch and Talmadge, and a few accounts and photographs scattered in government archives or other periodicals, documentation of the Christian Herald's relief work during the late 19th and early 20th centuries has disappeared. Meanwhile, the Christian Herald's competition Agencies like the American Red Cross or the Carnegie and Rock Rockefeller Foundations have compiled vast archives chronicling the endeavors of celebrated leaders such as Clara Barton, who probably you all have heard of, um, or John D. Rockefeller. 
As a result, most histories of humanitarianism have focused on these elite figures and the large-scale government agencies and philanthropic foundations they have overseen. By recovering the forgotten story of the Christian Herald's efforts to assuage affliction, my book tries to offer a fuller account of how evangelical media and its consumers contributed to the development of American humanitarianism. Although the newspaper's relief campaigns may have been eclipsed by the rise of massive charitable foundations and state-sponsored aid programs, I contend that the newspaper's grassroots, volunteer, and unapologetically religious approach to rel relieving suffering has had a lasting influence on the practice of philanthropy in the United States and has remained compelling for a considerable portion of the American population to the present day. So what can this story teach us about Christian charity in our own time? And what are the implications of the Christian Herald's legacy for the ethics and practice of philanthropy in the present? So to find out, you have to read the book. Um, <laughs> But as I, I'll tell you a little, little bit of my perspective. So as I worked on this project, I had the privilege of interacting with many people engaging and serving others through the Christian Herald Association, as well as through evangelical charities such as the Salvation Army and World Vision. Colleagues at these organizations attested that they wrestle with many of the same questions about relieving suffering that Klopsch and Talmadge raised in their newspaper over a century ago. Does charity create dependency? Who should philanthropists help? Is it better to meet the immediate needs of the hurting and homeless or to invest in efforts to address the structural causes of poverty? How can cash-strapped organizations with limited resources do both? Why are so many people oblivious to the suffering of others? How can charitable agencies encourage empathy for the afflicted without reinforcing social disparities, economic inequalities, racial discrimination, gender biases, and nationalist hierarchies? For my friends at these philanthropic organizations, my hope is that reflecting on the experiences, achievements, and struggles of their forerunners can offer useful resources for addressing the enduring challenges of alleviating affliction and creating a more just global society. Might Talmadge's vision of a radically inclusive America made great through the influx of people from every tribe and tongue provide inspiration for contemporary Christians striving to resist the anti-immigrant sentiment and actions of leaders, even those recent ones, such as that of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who last fall relocated 48 Venezuelan asylum seekers from Texas to Martha's Vineyard right here in Massachusetts without their informed consent or any advance notice to the island community. If today's evangelicals, especially the millennial generation, who are, according to some researchers, quote, more diverse, less nationalistic, and more heterodox in their views than older generations, it were aware that their predecessors championed a radical transformation of the economic order according to, quote, the biblical principles of Christian socialism, could conversations about poverty, hunger, homelessness, and universal health care shift? Might Klopsch's own life story of delinquency and redemption and his subsequent insistence that, quote, there is no depth of human misery and degradation so low that it cannot be reached by the love of Christ, could that change attitudes towards mass incarceration and motivate criminal justice reform? What about Klopsch's claim that true Christian charity must not be, quote, limited to our household nor to our own, our own countrymen? His contention that, quote, neither distance nor difference of race nor unworthiness is to be a barrier to relieving those in need. Can these convictions help counter the spread of various forms of tribalism, nationalism, and racism that are hampering efforts to reduce suffering both at home in the United States and around the world. Even if these hopes that the Christian Herald story might inspire a new generation of evangelical philanthropists to challenge injustice on a global scale prove unrealistic, I would like to suggest that the history I recount in Holy Humanitarians has relevance well beyond its potential implication for the particular religious community of evangelicals. And to explain how I think uh, this study might be significant for anyone involved in efforts to release, relieve distress of neighbors or distant strangers, I want to 
go back to the book cover. So this illustration, which is entitled America, the Almoner of the World, appeared on the front page of the Christian Herald in June of 1901, just as Klopt and Talmadge were celebrating the sensational success of the largest humanitarian aid effort in their history, the India Famine Relief Campaign. And also, not coincidentally, amid growing criticism of American imperialism and military atrocities in the Philippines, as well as increasingly vocal outcries about brutal and ongoing violence against African Americans in the United States, brought forcefully to nationally attention by the publication in 1900 of Ida B. Wells Barnett's Lynch Law in America, in which she condemned the extrajudicial, quote, wholesale slaughter of black men, women, and children as, quote, our country's national crime. It was precisely at this moment of mounting anxiety about and directs attacks on the United States status as a Christian nation that the newspaper published this image on its cover. I chose America the Almoner of the World as the cover for my book because it captures so well the Christian Herald's expansive vision of domestic charity and international aid, while also exposing the presumptions and blind spots that shaped evangelical efforts to relieve affliction with the United States and around the world. Presumption and blind spots that have had an enduring effect, I argue, on the ways that many Americans, not just evangelicals, regard and respond to suffering at home and abroad. By portraying the United States as a noble, magnanimous savior who alone possessed the power and resources to aid needy people across the globe, Klopsch and his colleagues endorsed the notion that the nation was divinely ordained and uniquely qualified to uplift the downtrodden unshackle the oppressed, and become the world's quote, most generous benefactor in times of famine, plague, flood, and earthquake. Unlike other empires, these evangelical publicists proclaimed, the United States would exercise its authority on the global stage through the extension of Christian charity, a practice that it could encompass disaster relief and social reform, but also economic expansion and military intervention. Throughout the 1890s and beyond, Klopsch and Talmadge filled their newspaper with images and stories that reinforced this message of American exceptionalism, even as they turned a blind eye to reports that the army was committing war crimes against Filipino civilians and ignored appeals from activists like Ida B. Wells to speak out against the torture and murder of thousands of the nation's black citizens. Depicting the United States as the almoner of the world while disregarding ev any evidence that might tarnish this image proved a very effective strategy for engaging ordinary Americans in the work of domestic philanthropy and international humanitarianism during Klopp's life and for many decades after his death. Indeed, over the course of the 20th and 21st centuries, presumptions about the United States' responsibility to assist the needy and protect the persecuted have continued to influence the development of American social policy, foreign affairs, and the remarkable growth of the nonprofit sector. Representing the nation as the rescuer of sufferers in distress has resulted in an outpouring of financial donations from American citizens in times of crisis, the creation of a plethora of state-sponsored and non-governmental organizations to address the challenges of poverty, hunger, or homelessness, and numerous crusades to liberate the oppressed and succor the afflicted across the country and around the globe. And certainly, some of these accomplishments are worth celebrating. But as the Christian Herald story makes clear, we also must pay attention to the hazards involved in envisioning the United States as a nation specially commissioned by God to save the world. By examining how Klopsch, Talmadge, and their co-workers grappled with queries about when where and how to help suffering people, while also acknowledging uh, whose affliction they overlooked and why, Holy Humanitarians tries to bring into focus the theological principles and religious antipathies, nationalist ambitions and capitalist aspirations, racial prejudices and gender biases, class discriminations and cultural presumptions that have shaped and also limited the meaning and methods of American charity from the late 19th century to our own day. 
making visible the factors that influence the Christian Herald's decision about the nature and practice of compassion, invites us to consider our own blind spots, the often unexamined assumptions, agendas, and inequalities of power that motivate and also distort our own efforts to extend justice and mercy to the ends of the earth. Thank you. So I think we have some time for questions, and I'm happy to open up for conversation. Dr. Curtis, thanks. I'm not sure if this is on or not. Dr. Curtis, thanks so much um, for this talk. My question is, is maybe one of those um, unanswerable mind-reading type questions yeah. as far as I'm curious about the motivation. As best you can tell, for that, that blind spot or that omission on the part of the editors of the Christian Herald, um, of focusing on American exceptionalism as, as sort of a pure, uh, unadulterated uh, viewpoint and ignoring abuses at home, social, uh, social injustices at home. I'm just wondering, as far as you can tell, was that a genuine blind spot where they were just unconscious or could it have been par partly a, uh, an intentional calculated uh, way to reach out, like you said, it was more effect. They were more effective yeah. by ignoring those kind of things and having that blind spot. As far as maybe making that appeal to the American Christian public, and not, in a sense, disturbing the American Christian public by by acknowledging America's own failings. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. And I think um, so. I think it actually is not. It's an intention. In my my view, it's an intentional blind spot. It would be hard to have been a, a publisher, a newspaper publisher at this time, and to ignore someone like Ida B. Wells, who is making news all over the country with her critique of um, lynching and white supremacy in the South. And so the other thing that's happening, of course, during this time is an effort to reunify the nation still, you know, after the Civil War, and Christians are, denominations are particularly engaged in that project, trying to reunify the Methodist Church South, the Methodist Church North, trying to reunify the Baptist, the Southern Baptist Convention. And so had Klopsch publicized or taken up the critiques of race and uh, white supremacy that Wells was making, he would have lost subscribers. So I think, um, I definitely, I mean, they, Nothing. Con so it's, it's very interesting to me always what suffering can be discussed and what needs to be ignored. Um, it's interesting to me thinking about that in terms of race and capitalism. I think there, there are areas where I, I think, again, some of the discourse that we have in our contemporary culture where you can't say the word socialism if you're a politician, um, especially in particular context, like that was not a controversial issue in the in this period in the way that race was. So thank you for the question. Hi. Hi. Um, so you talked about, uh, especially towards the end, the debate that came up in the early 1900s about America being a Christian nation and being founded as a Christian nation. And that's a debate I see very ongoing. That's something that my friends and I talk about pretty frequently and go back and forth on. When that uh, phrase and that topic comes up, um, how do you see people talking about it at the time? Um, is it based on founders' convictions? Is it based on the structure that they saw around them? Um, and how, how does that play out in all of this? Yeah, great question. Um, so there is just a, there's a wonderful book underway by the historian Catherine Breckis at Harvard Div School that's writing about the history of the Christian nation concept and how it's, you know, changes over time. And I think, so for, I, I mean, this actually I do think is a genuine blind spot for Klopsch and Talmadge. I mean, they truly believed, as did most evangelicals throughout the 19th century, that the, the United States was divinely ordained to do God's work in the world. And where the, um, 
the debate was, was what does that look like, right? So there were evangelicals who believed that the influx of um, people of color from other parts of the world was undermining sort of a white Christian nationalism. Talmadge and Klopt didn't believe that. They believed that the United States was a place that I think as you heard me say, sort of that God was creating a new um, sort of amalgamation of the, the kingdom of God was coming about in the United States in terms of bringing people together. Um, I think this, this is also a blind spot, I think is that image, I don't know if it's still up there. Um, nope, um, shows that it, uh, <laughs> Sorry, Ruth. Um, that they also believe that this gave sort of a, a Christian nation savior complex, right? That the United States was divinely ordained. So I think it was part. I, there was, there was. I mean, where you get the critique again of the Christian nation is from um, the black community in particular, saying if the United States is a Christian nation, how can it be allowing? the kind of barbarity it, that's happening throughout the American South. So a lot of times the, the Christian nation idea was that the United States was divinely ordained to civilize other nations and sort of bring them into Christian civilization. And then the critique is that the United States is not a civilized nation. So there's debate about that at the time. And I think for some, I mean, this really does, when I saw this image, I knew that this was gonna be the cover of the book and because it really encapsulates that sense of confidence um, and also shows the, the kind of inequality that that image um, in, instantiates here, Like right? This is the United States in the center and then all of these other nations are dependent on the largesse of Christian America. Part of the curtis. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for coming, even though it's very windy today. Um, yeah. I mean, it, no. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I guess this is not a question. I guess this is more of a comment. But like, again, like re in regards to white nationalism and race and uh, and injustices, I think that way for Christians to move forward when we reach out and serve, I think we also have to acknowledge our wrongs, like such as a uh, preaching slavery in in yeah, in the name of God, and also how Christian, how in the United States, you know, we view interracial marriage as a, as sins, you know, I mean, like, I mean, like, just because, just because, I mean, we're all sinners, and yeah, we all make mistakes, and, and if we want, yeah, um, if, and if, if, and if we want others to, um, respect us, then we must also, we must, yeah, say that we're, we're not perfect, and, 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 uh, and uh, apologize. Yeah. And actually, tell the be willing to acknowledge the truth of this history. Right? I mean, this is some of the other battles that are going on in education today that are erasing some of the history that I'm telling here. Like in certain audiences, I would get in big trouble for this talk, right? Because it's talking about parts of our history that um, a vision like this doesn't want to. Just as Klopsch couldn't acknowledge aspects of the kind of contemporary situation in his own day. So too, we also don't want to acknowledge in certain settings that there is a history that needs to be repented and atoned for. Um, and even it's a story. So I, I do, um, I do. The, the more that time goes on, the more I think the relevance of an image like this can help us understand, you know, that these, these are things that we need to still wrestle with. So thank you so much. No, I go. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll go first, and then and then you. Okay, um, thank you so much for coming. Um, and I was wondering if you have any insight into what the American evangelical response was when aid started becoming um, something that governments started investing in. You know, in the second half of the 20th century. So, what did that look like? Um, was there a mixed response? Was there more of the idea that um, charity should be a private thing and not a government-sponsored thing? So just what yeah, that look like? That's such a good question. So um, part of my favorite part about uh, writing and researching this book is that I discovered a huge feud between Lewis Klopsch and Clara Barton. So they, Clara Barton was founding the American Red Cross at this time, <laughs> and they were competing to be sort of the government-sponsored premier aid agency of the United States. And they got into like serious head-on clashes about this. So what that told me is even at the time, uh, even Klopsch, as at least, 
as a representative of this massive um, aid um, organization, was not at all opposed to partnering with the government. He wanted um, the, gov the Christian Herald to be the public facing um, and arm of the United States and, and international aid. And part of his argument goes back to the Christian, Christian nation. He believed that in the United States, the way for the United States to demonstrate its exceptionalism as an empire was to have an explicitly Christian uh, aid. And Clara Barton was very uh, specific that that was not her vision, that the aid should be unsectarian. So he lost out to her. Um, obviously, um, the, the Red Cross does become a quasi-governmental agency, and he had to kind of find a different way forward. Um, so I didn't go much farther than I, what, like, so that transition in the early 20th century. And so I think the later history um, gets more complex because it has to do with the rise of evangelical NGOs like World Vision, changes in tax laws that create these large philanthropic uh, foundations. But I think at the, in the early stage, there wasn't an antipathy to partnering with the government. It was just what that partnership would look like. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I was taken by the notion of blind spots, but also of these newspaper editors. And maybe I'd access between theoretical and pragmatics or practical, right? And so I think that in my own understanding of evangelical history shortly thereafter, this swing back and forth between progressive, practical, pragmatic, let's get this done kind of thinking, and then reactions to it. I think even Gordon Collard's own inheritance here in terms of some of the founders in the 20s and 30s of new evangelicalism of, well, that was wrong. That went wrong somehow, right? Because they didn't take care of some of these things. So we need to go back to a kind of purified, more, you know. So I, I see that swing going back and forth between these, these folks who are like, our job is to get it done, and we need to say and do whatever it takes to get people inspired, you know, yep. and, and to, to do these things. And then the proof of the pudding is in the eating, as it were, in terms of things happening. And these reactions that continually happen within broadly evangelical communities to that lost the focus on what really matters, which is a certain theological precision. Yeah. And so how that, that back and forth has affected this story as well. And, yeah. and that's just as my own experience is that kind of back and forth and, and sort of re, reaction to, the reactionism within evangelicalism to um, aid. Yeah. No, I think, um, I don't know if there was a question in there, but I think towards the end of the book, we do start to see some of those fissures that I mentioned early on kind of really starting to affect, to rupture, and we, we start to see the Christian Herald have to comment more on the tension between sort of individual salvation, caring about personal souls, and social action. Um, it's, it becomes harder to hold together the center. Um, and after, I mean, so the Christian, I mean, I only actually tell, some of you might be familiar with the Christian Herald. It has a whole history after I end this book. So I end in like 1918, Klopsch dies in 1910, and then, but the Christian Herald becomes a massively popular periodical in the mid 20th century that is sort of an in-between fundamentalist and modernist for like this sort of broad-based community that's, again, though, distinctly linked with a kind of nationalist vision in the 1940s and 50s. So that's for one of you all students to write that book. There's still <laughs> there's a whole other book to be written about the Christian Herald and its role in shaping evangelical consciousness and maybe less so in its aid work. They, they really start, they st as, the, as the American Red Cross sort of becomes ascendant, they pull back on international aid. So this, what I write about is the heyday, and they do keep some of like the Bowery Mission still exist, um, but that's really their only, now the Bowery Mission is like the, is the primary focus. And um, the, the Christian Herald Association, which is the parent organization, I think, as I mentioned, still struggles with these tensions with, within its own sense of mission um, in terms of ministering to people in need um, of all faiths, sort of being concerned about issues of sort of personal spirituality versus structural reform and justice. And so I think the tensions, it's the pendulum, but I also think that there are internal tensions that, that, that haven't been resolved and may not be able to be. Dr. Curtis, I just wanted to say, first of all, your, your presentation was absolutely wonderful. I Thank you. I got so much out of it. But you raise, I think, an intriguing question uh, that kind of you dropped. Uh, and, 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 and the question is, 
um, what happened to the records that are gone? I, yeah. you, 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 the, the tone of your voice when you said that, so, you know, I feel bad about this and I'm not going to go into it. Yeah. But can you elaborate a little yeah, bit on that sure. point? So I can share both like a, my, my, my biggest um, joys of doing this project was, so when I started this project, that um, there's, there's one set of existing copies of the Christian Herald newspaper in a full run that were in the Christian Herald Association headquarters in a brownstone in Manhattan. And like if it burned down, if it, so we were able at Tufts to get money from the internet archive to digitize all of those. And we're just about to like, finish, we got up to 1921 when copyright starts, so now we're trying to figure out how to digitize 1921 till I think the period when it's on microfilm. So we at least we have those. But what when I sat with the president when I first started, I said, surely you must have, like, where are all the letters? From where are like the organizational records? And he said, well, you know, the organization had moved from its headquarters in New York to um, wasn't Chita like someplace in the suburbs in the mid 20th century. And when they moved back into Manhattan, they just threw everything away. Yeah, I know it's a historian's heartbreak. It's so, um, so I think part of the story for those of you who are history majors, I mean, there are pieces of the story in government archives. So the conflict with the Red Cross is all documented in, in the National Archives, um, Clara Barton's paper, so you can, find pieces of it, um, finding like Klopsch's prison sentence, like that was really um, an archivist, you know, tracking down records from Sing Sing, but yeah, so that's, and this again gets to the tension of, I, I think it, charitable organizations have multiple, and what he said to me was, our core mission is serving the hungry and like maintaining the records, but he was just like, it just didn't seem important. And um, so understandable, but also terribly heartbreaking. So I keep, there's actually a novel about the Christian Herald, about the Bowery mission, and in the novel, the, um, the chapel, which I showed in one of the slides, has a secret room where the, these, like some records are stored. So I went to my friend James, who's now the, I'm like, is there a secret room? He's like, I wish there were, but <laughs> no. It's like, so thank you for the question, yeah. Um, so when it comes to personal, personal charitable giving, right, there's, often this idea that, well, because it's my money, right? I want to put my money, I, put, I, would have, I want to put my trust in an organization or an agency that aligns with my personal values, right? Uh, and so um, today, I think one of the, you know, the big divisive cultural issues is like LGBTQ rights and uh, organizations like the Salvation Army have come under fire for their positions, I guess, regarding these kind of questions. Um, and so I was wondering what kind really what are the lessons that we can learn from this early period of evangelical humanitarianism and what are the lessons we can learn from there about how to engage with basically this idea that these different organizations have different missions they have different like i guess ethical obligations or um yeah like how are we supposed to well not how are we supposed to but what do you think we can learn about them about how to navigate kind of this space where Sometimes, um, you know, we our, our personal convictions seem to be at odds with the organization mm -hmm. that we're trying to partner with or work with, or to, we're, we want to help them to do the work that they do. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I mean, I can say a little bit about the fact, like the question you're raising about how do we, um, there was a big controversy, I was writing the book, where there was a report about the Red Cross, like how much of the money that was donated to um, earthquake relief in Haiti to the Red Cross actually went to overhead for the organization rather than helping people on the ground. So that's that question of um, not just sort of the transparency of the values of the organization, but the, how the organization actually does its work and what the percentage of our contributions go to helping actual people versus paying aid workers to go over. And I think these were things, I mean, I will say Klopsch and Talmadge were super concerned. Um, and one of the things I found very interesting about their approach and their fight with Clara Barton is that they argued, so people would send, what they would do is say, we're, we're raising money for I India famine relief and the campaign fund is open. And the, every contribution that they would, they would receive, like if it was, even if it was like 30 cents, which was more back then than it is now, but small, they would print 
the name of the, they would have these huge sheets in the newspaper with names of the donor and the amounts. Um, and they would have, whether it was you know, like a Sunday school class would get together. So part of what they were trying to do is pro provide like accountability and transparency. And then they would publish an audit at the end of each campaign. Um, and they would argue that they were a better resource for funding than the Red Cross, not just because of the values, like the Red Cross is more secular. I don't think they actually use that term, but it wasn't explicitly Christian, but also because they would send this India famine money to missionaries in India who would then had local, you know, were longstanding residents of the area and would partner with local communities and local churches to distribute funds. Whereas the Red Cross model was to send American aid workers over to these countries where they had no cultural context and they had much less success, uh, at least initially. And we might argue still, like when they're not partnering, if there's a model that's kind of based in local communities. So how they navigated part of the question is, like, who is trustworthy? The Christian Herald, we're trustworthy. We published you know, transparently all of our um, records of the campaign, and we also um, are able to distribute aid in a way that's more effective. Um, but your second question of like conflicting values, I think um, part of what they, like I, it's this is something I can't really speculate on, like what would Klopsch think about the LGBT community, but like if there was a controversial issue, I think that's what we were discussing a little bit before, they tried to sort of present um, opportunities for engagement that they didn't think would be controversial. So if suddenly they had done a campaign to raise money for um, investigating, you know, lynching allegations, like would that have raised a lot of money? I, probably not. And so I, I think that's the tension, right, of trying to figure out, like, and, and in so doing, they ignored, you know, a massive humanitarian crisis in the United States by not raising something that might have been controversial. I'm not sure that exactly answers what you're asking, but I hope it's a little bit helpful. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so my question has to deal with the economic uh, portion of this. Um, capitalism obviously has major problems with it, but it also enabled the uh, these organizations to get started and to raise the kind of money they did. So I'm wondering, just from, from the research that you've done, more what your opinion on uh, a policy m might be. Is it, is it more productive to find ways to use capitalism and use capitalism to get better outcomes or to look for a different, different economic paradigm or economic light, uh, yeah. way of life that we can use to achieve these outcomes. Yeah, I mean, I think one of going back this to the Christian nation question a little bit, that part of why the um, Christian socialism program wasn't controversial because it was framed in a vision of the United States as bringing about the kingdom of God, right? And that they were able to, so the, I mean, I did find Klopsch and Talmadge's critique of laissez-faire capitalism, unregulated capitalism. Um, just like Klopsch was a like major combatant with um, Clara Barton, he was also hugely critical of Andrew Carnegie. Um, Andrew Carnegie, at the time, he wrote a book called The Gospel of Wealth that came out just as Klopsch was starting. And so on the one hand, they'd have pictures of Andrew Carnegie on the front of the newspaper celebrating like, look what you can achieve in the United States. You can achieve, you know, the sort of racial algor myth. You can rise from your bootstraps. You can achieve success. But at the same time, they also said Carnegie's strategy, and Carnegie was definitely critical of their bread lines of the Bowery Mission and said, you know, if you want to, the kind of charity that works is to give someone a hand up. You create a library so that someone can go in and read books and get educated. And if someone doesn't want to sort of, take the ladders and the rungs of the ladder and climb up, that's their own fault. And they're sort of evolutionarily not fit to be part of society. So for Klopsch and Talmadge, that kind of, um, like the, what they said is actually what Carnegie should do is pay his workers better wages, right? He doesn't need to accumulate that much wealth that he can donate a library. We should have a more equitable system. So I think 
I mean, f for I, I think that there's wisdom, right, in that the kind of regulations that they were asking for were, um, I think, I mean, Calvage put it, we need a redistribution of property, right? So he wasn't against, it's not that they were advocating the, you know, Marxist communism, the overthrow of the capitalist order, but they were advocating for what they saw as reasonable um, laws that would, you know, provide to prevent the incredible accumulation of fortunes and the Astors and the Carnegies and the robber barons that were, they were living beside in New York City. And I think, um, I mean, I also think it comes out of, I argue in the book, and this is a bit of speculation because I, I don't really have the records for it, but Klopsch's own experience being imprisoned and, you know, growing up as an, he was an immigrant himself from Germany and faced economic hardship and sort of understood, and, and he died a millionaire. I mean, this made him wealthy. The Christian Herald made him wealthy. So it's, I think the tension you're bringing up is, yes, I mean, he was an anti-capitalist per se, but he definitely was anti-laissez-faire, unregulated capitalism. And I think that there's a lot of wisdom in um, the kind of Christian socialism that they put forward as a vision. I would wish that we could, I wish that that was a more, um, I wish that more people would read Charles Sheldon today as opposed to just wear the bracelet, right, and actually see what he said. Like, may, could there be policy proposals that would come out of it? I think possibly. I mean, these are things that have been discussed in, under the um, sort of rubric of democratic socialism and actually um, when he was a candidate for president, Bernie Sanders went and spoke at Liberty University and tried to make the case for a commonality between his own vision of democratic socialism and Liberty University's biblical Christianity. And I don't think he got very far, but, um, but you can find that speech on YouTube and it's, it's interesting like within this context. Okay, um, as successful as the Christian Herald was at crossing congregational or denominational uh, divides, it doesn't seem to have reached into the Catholic community. So I'm wondering yeah, if you could comment question. on relationships with the Catholics and if there Great are similar question. issues or tensions in Catholic, uh, Catholic relief efforts, especially internationally. How did the American Catholic Church? Yeah. Great question. So it's in fast. I mean, this is a time of like rampant anti-Catholicism in the United States. There's fears that the Pope is trying to take over America through immigration of uh, Catholics from Southern Europe and even Germany, right? So th these are, and the, remarkably, the I mean, in keeping, I suppose, with Talmadge's vision of the United States and maybe Klopsch's own immigrant experience, they were much less anti-Catholic than their Protestant peers. They rarely, they never published any of the papal conspiracy theories and Talmadge actually would uh, have interfaith. We might, they wasn't used, that word wasn't used, but he would preach alongside, a, he would invite Catholic clergy and uh, Jewish rabbis to participate with him in celebrations of different events. They did not partner across denominational lines in terms of aid, right, aid reliefs. And I think partly that's because, I mean, I'm not an expert in Catholicism, so if, if someone else is, you can jump in, but they are, that Catholic Church is building its infrastructure at this time, especially in areas of hospitals and um, schools, um, prob more focused on sort of trying to survive the anti-Catholic sentiment, so probably less engaged in international relief campaigns, but where it would come up would be, um, questions about like, are we going to serve Catholics in our, um, like are we gonna provide relief to Catholic countries like Italy when there's, or Mexico, where there are predominant Catholic populations and floods in Mexico. And there Klopsch and Talmadge would insist that this was the, the command of Jesus no matter, this also came up, I mean, the other place where it really comes up is with Muslims and there they start, there. so there's a crisis in Armenia and there's an earthquake in Armenia um, prior to, or sorry, in Constantinople, just prior to the beginnings of the uh, massacres of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. And they actually mount this huge campaign to provide relief for um, the sufferers in Constantinople. And they're very, very clear about what they call cosmopolitan charity, that it needs to reach Muslims. And they actually 
but they get backlash for this, I think especially as Armenians who are Christians start to be persecuted by the Ottoman Empire and then they start to reverse course. So on the one hand, they have these sort of pure principles and then on the other hand, they're very attuned to the vagaries of political um, controversy. But with Catholics, they're pretty consistently resisting the sort of broad anti-Catholic movement that's happening. Good question. Thank you so much. So much food for thought. And uh, may we take some of the best, uh, the best lessons <laughs> uh, that you've offered here today and um, think about how we can apply them in our own work here and abroad as so many uh, students are interested in these very same questions um, and you. work. So thank you so much. Thank everybody for coming today. Thank you all for the opportunity and for the wonderful conversation. I really appreciate being here. Thank you.